Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker. I am an author, a speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I'm passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members of IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. Ah, these are some of my all-time favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. Last week, I talked with Dr. Carlos Santos about the book of Enoch and how it has echoes in the book of Daniel. So I thought maybe we could remain in some of these interesting books, Daniel, 4th Ezra, Revelation. But today we also look at how we establish genre, more specifically how some of the categories we develop are just too limiting for the creative blend of text that we see in a singular book. Today, we will listen to a part of the roundtable talk between Dr. Yeshai Gruber and Dr. Hindi Nyman that is called Revelation and Interpretation. You know this is going to be good, right? Perhaps a little bit complex, but it's Revelation and Interpretation. In fact, one of our students who watched the talk wrote in a comment saying, quote, To me, this is like eating a sandwich at the deli, one that you haven't tried before and finding out that it really was tasty, but the fillings are something you have never heard of or tried. And so I hope you are ready to try this new sandwich of a conversation. Dr. Nyman is the Oriel and Lang Professor of Interpretation of Holy Scriptures and the Director of the Center for the Study of Bible at the University of Oxford. She has published extensively in biblical and related fields, ranging from philology to culture and legal studies. Professor Nyman elaborates on the nature of revelation and interpretation in ancient Judaisms and offers insight into how that early literature still influences our religious conceptions today. From the beginning, the conversation addresses the categories we bring to our text with theological expectations. And then sometimes because of those categories and expectations, we map that onto the text that we are studying, trying to make them fit our shapes. Sometimes we simply need a reminder that we need to let the text tell its own story, even if it's with a blend of genres. So let's start with Revelation, you know, apocalypse, the unveiling of cosmic mysteries and its connection to prophecy. Lean in and enjoy the conversation. I have no problem with talking about the verb to reveal, right, apocalyptain, as a smaller part of the larger phenomenon of the revelatory. And prophecy is part of that as well. There are a number of points of critique. Um, One is the way in which apocalyptic came to be identified as a a separate genre, a separate category apart from prophecy, um, which I think doesn't really capture what we might call so-called apocalyptic texts in, in Tanakh, right, in the Hebrew Bible. A writer like Daniel, for example, is both invoking the prophetic, the liturgical. He's certainly contemplating end time and he's very mindful of his own present. But I think to talk about an entire movement that's swept away by apocalyptic seems to obscure more than it illuminates as I've written in a number of different places or another text like fourth Ezra, which has been called an apocalyptic text is just as easy, just as easily characterized as a sapiential text, a wisdom text, a liturgical text, a text that's obsessed with recovering and repeating like Mishneh Torah, like Deuteronomy, the law, and making sure to be able to preserve it and to portray it. And Ezra himself is called a prophet in 4th Ezra, in chapter 12, verse 42 of 4th Ezra. Um, So for me, I think continuity as opposed to discontinuity with respect to the prophetic is very important. And another aspect that I've written about quite a lot is thinking and rethinking what we might mean by so fan of law, by the end of prophecy. Is prophecy transformed and redefined in the hands of the rabbis, or does it actually die to the rabbis into the history of Judaism? And my my answer is that 
just like the law continues to be vibrant and dynamic for early Christianity, so too the prophetic call and inspired interpretation um, and the history of of Moses, of David, of, um, of Jeremiah continues to be alive and present to the rabbis and beyond. I just think apocalyptic is one aspect of the revelatory. Prophecy literally means to bear witness or to warn. That's another aspect of the revelatory. To say that prophecy died to the rabbis is somehow to misunderstand the revelatory nature of ongoing interpretation and the life and breath of Judaism as a whole. Mm -hmm, which I think mm -hmm. continues to understand itself to be an inspired religion. Uh, fascinating. Um, and and, and yeah. I think part of, part, of what's, part of what happens is this notion of late Judaism or spate Judentum, with that brings the claim that prophecy dies to Judaism and the spirit dies to Judaism and all that's left is legal thinking and scribalism. And that's just not, that doesn't capture what the texts say about themselves. There are moments where the end of prophecy is characterized by Tosefta Sota or by Josephus or by First Maccabees, but it's about the line of the prophets in the institution of prophets, not about the phenomenon of the revelatory itself. In, the interpretive project is essential to all of prophetic writings, including these apocalyptic notions. Angels are all over prophetic and even historiographical texts. So some of the problem here, I think, is the categories that we bring to the texts that are already complicated by theological expectations that the history of the field of biblical studies and more generally the scientific study of Judaism, this and Shabtis Judentums brings with it. And then we superimpose it on a past and we talk about our categories as though they're real for ancient Judaism. And that couldn't, in, in all, it, sometimes it maps on, but generally that's, you know, we, we have to be, we have to give ourselves the space for the texts of ancient Judaism to tell their story without being co-opted by their story, you know, without believing in the, you know, forces of light and the forces of darkness are getting kind of, you know, torn to pieces by the fear of, you know, Elijah and the prophets. We both understand and we teach, but we also need to understand what the texts are saying about themselves. And they're not telling us that the revel that revelation or inspiration has died to this tradition at all. Quite to the contrary, there's this intermingling or even um, convergence of claims around the oracular or the revelatory or the prophetic, which um, are interlinked in the world of paganism, of Christianity, and of Judaism. And I think in order to study any, any one religion, we have to study the phenomenon of the oracular in all three. So this is an interesting take on apocalyptic or revelatory writings, of which we have a lot in the second century BCE through the second century CE. So in the roundtable talk, Dr. Gruber then asks about one of Professor Naiman's specialties, Fourth Ezra, which contains a lament over the destruction of Solomon's temple. While that is the content of the book, most scholars think that the writing dates to the time after the destruction of the second temple, especially since it contains visions and glimpses into the heavenly realm and interactions with angels. And this led to an interesting conversation about the definition of time periods, especially the term second temple. Yeah, well, let me let me begin by just saying how deceptive the term Second Temple Judaism is, because we know, I, I think you'd be very hard pressed to find a scholar that said that Fourth Ezra was written before the destruction of the Second Temple. Everyone would acknowledge that it was written after the destruction of the Second Temple. What I want to say is that it's quite characteristic of what we would call Hellenistic period and late antique history, historical Jewish texts from the period. Not all of the texts look like this, but Zechariah, Daniel, Jubilees, 4th Ezra, um, the Syriac Apocalypse of Baruch, and many, many other texts, 4Q Mysteries, 1st Enoch and beyond, Hechalot. So they're Jewish texts, texts that are only preserved in early Christian materials, but also a book like Revelation that really shares a lot of features with a text like 4th Ezra. So what I would say is that a number of the features of Fourth Ezra located in this period of late Hellenistic Judaism and late antiquity. And it's also participating in 
pagan and Christian themes, as well as Jewish themes of the period. I think in a very simple way, Fourth Ezra is writing itself into this collection um, Hmm. and self-authorizing, which is, by the way, not so unusual. I think we see this in many texts across the prophetic and sapiential materials um, in ancient Judaism from Tanakh all the way through um, the Hellenistic period and beyond. But the only reason why I push back on Second Temple is, first of all, um, some of the texts that we call Second Temple are actually written in diaspora. They're not necessarily land of Israel, but even more than that, it's a historical period that locates influences and contributes to the shaping of Judaism in this golden age. I don't think it's an age of humiliation or assimilation. I think it's an age of vibrant and vital tenacity and survival. Hmm. And Fourth Ezra, I believe, is part of that story of overcoming what is almost certainly a reaction to um, the decimation of the Jewish people in the aftermath of the Bar Kokhba revolts in 132 to 134. I mean, many people from, you know, from the discussions of Adorno after the Shoah to discussions of how to date and when to date lamentations. I think most scholars, especially informed by trauma studies and psychoanalysis, will argue that descriptions of trauma and destruction are not written in the immediate aftermath of destruction. And there's a kind of paralysis um, and silence in the face of of. Of destruction. I wrote about this a little bit in um, the language of Eich Nashir et Shir Adonai Alat Mat Nechar. You know, is it possible to sing a song of God on foreign soil? And I, I took this in part as a question is it possible to sing again, to speak again, to utter again in the face of destruction? And I think the Book of Lamentations itself, Eicha, also is reflecting on the possibility or the impossibility of speaking in the aftermath of destruction. And, and Fourth Ezra, the protagonist in Fourth Ezra, who's called Chaaltiel, he's called Ezra sometimes, he seems to be Daniel or better than Daniel, or he's a Jeremiah figure at the very end. He seems to be like Moses again. This is a figure who is struggling to find the words to articulate what it means to overcome destruction, if it's ever possible. You know, is it ever possible to overcome loss? It's one of the themes I work out in my book, as you know. And since we are challenging definitions and we've heard about apocalyptic and then Second Temple, why not ask about scripture? And what would it mean to Jews at the time to edit, rewrite, or interpret scripture? Right. That's such a beautiful question. Um, um, and it's a very generous question for me. And it's actually one I think about all the time. Because to talk about rewriting or changing seems very like transgressive and um, it sounds to us in, you know, in 2023 to to transgress the very thing that we're meant to be preserving. The first thing we have to acknowledge, even before I'm going to complicate the story, is that there are texts that are quite stable in the biblical corpus from our earliest manuscripts, uh, Hebrew manuscripts, by which I mean the text found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those are our earliest Hebrew manuscripts. And what we find is a lot of stability across the text that we come to know now as the Pentateuch or Torah and the prophetic texts. There is some pluriformity or variation across the different versions, like in the Septuagint, in the Greek Bible or the Syriac Bible, or in, as well as in the Latin Bible. And, and there are also version, versional difference across a Hebrew register. I think what's very important for us, even before I answer the question about renew scripture, is to say that identity of a book is not necessarily the same thing as having a fixed text in the way we think about it now. And we know that there are versions of Jeremiah, that the book of Jeremiah is bigger, smaller in different versions and different recessions. We know that the collection of Psalms as we know it from Tanakh has different versions, different numberings, even different orderings in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as across other linguistic um, registers. And so I say all of this, but even before I talk about, you know, rewriting, because to celebrate, to renew scripture may not mean to just repeat it exactly as it is. I mean, every utterance of not moving to the right or to the left with respect to repetition of scripture in the Bible and Josephus and beyond, rewrite scripture. That is, it updates, transforms, um, and reanimates scripture, rearticulates scripture. 
And part of what I would want to say is that there is an emerging set of texts that increasingly are fixed and set, so much so that we can talk about traditions of kri uchtiv, of, of it's written one way, it's read another way, and it becomes increasingly crystallized. But at the same time, the text as they are read continue to be animated and reanimated in many, many different ways through um, chanting, right? Through liturgical chanting of the texts, through how we point the text, how we articulate it through vocalization, as well as how these texts are interpreted at their most basic translation levels. I wanna say two things. I wanna say in a much simpler way, I wanna say that scripture itself is repeated and copied and transmitted as scripture. And we know this even in the synagogues in Alexandria when Philo of Alexandria talks about the reading of scripture and the interpretation in synagogue until well into the day, he says, the elders and the priests come and, and explicate and explain after we've read from the Torah. But in addition to that, we also have ways of animating scripture through new prayers, new songs. Um, and I think what the, the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown us is that these new liturgical texts are already being produced at the same time as some of our latest biblical texts. And that's a wild concept. The second half of Daniel is from the Hellenistic period. Psalm 119 is almost certainly also from the Hellenistic period. We know that there are texts and traditions that are embedded in, in the Tanakh itself that are editing and re-editing and updating the texts across the Persian and Hellenistic periods. And they're not only capturing the moment of history when it's actually written, you know, the very words themselves. But this is part of the vitality and vibrancy. You know, the rabbis knew this when they suggested, hmm, maybe Joshua helped Moses finish those psukim at the end of Deuteronomy. And I think we're so scared of what is, um, um, what is theologically, you know, quote unquote, kosher or precise, that we don't allow ourselves to embrace the very possibilities that are embedded in the ancients and medievals thinking, whether it's Ibn Ezra or Rambam, whether it's Rashi or it's, um, or it's Bavli. So I, I think part of what I want to say is what's vibrant and vital about the tradition is embedded in the thinking and breathing of these text and textual traditions. All you need to do is look at the variety of approaches um, that we see in the different um, Masoretic texts. There isn't a single Masoretic text. There are different manuscripts which will record different practices of um, vocalization, of putting the kud in, and also different practices of um, chanting, of um, the song that goes along with the reading of the Torah in the synagogue. Associated with the question of defining and editing scripture is the issue of the authority of scripture. This is where the rub is for so many people. What we mean by authority conferring strategies or interpretive authority, something I wrote about already in 1999 in an article on Jubilees, what I was trying to write then, and I continue to think about it, I just gave a paper um, a few months ago, again, on, on authority. I was asked to talk about authority, how, to, how does one authorize texts and interpretations. I think we really have to give these texts from antiquity the space to offer different models for authority. One paper I gave with a colleague of mine was about the IU, the, the Buber and Rosenzweig's account of law and understanding that it's not about um, identifying the author in the a Deuteronomistic a law code or in the covenant code, but rather understanding the presentness, says Buber and Rosenzweig. Every time this law is uttered, there's a new presentness, which allows for activation, um, updating, but also the transformation of the law. It's one, it's one way actually to explain radical transformations of the covenant code in the Deuteronomic law code, but also the way in which these laws continue to be applied, updated, and integrated into day-to-day -day life. You know, Judaism is a living tradition, and it's always been a lived tradition. It doesn't end. It, it, it continues. And when to go back to one of your first questions, my biggest problem with language of apocalyptic versus prophecy, you know, the, the notions of the revelatory didn't die to Judaism and law didn't die to Christianity, right? These are almost like a, like a, like a double helix. They continue to interweave and to reconnect over time until this very day. 
What a beautiful thought to end on. And this particular roundtable talk is so full of additional conversations on pseudepigraphy, especially that of Moses, the ascribed writings of Moses. But you can go listen to the conversation yourself and follow that train of thought. We will pick up a little bit more from their conversation next week. Meanwhile, if you like these kind of conversations, you should join us at Israel Bible Center. You will get access to our whole library of roundtable talks with world-renowned scholars, along with access to our courses that dig into the details of Jewish culture and biblical interpretation. Thank you to Jeremy McDonald from Mason Jar Music for editing, mixing, and adding in all the good music. And thank you for hanging out with me and being curious about all things Bible-related.